let's bring in our political yeah. expert, David Dulio. He is a professor of political science and the director of the Center for Civic Engagement at Oakland University. Oakland University, also our Facebook partner of the day. It is always a pleasure having you on the show. Happy Friday to you, Professor. How are you? I'm great. Happy Friday to you guys. Where do you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> it seems like, well, these days there's uh, really an endless number of, of topics where we could uh, we could dip our toe in the water. I'll leave that up to you. Whatever, okay. whatever, whatever you want to talk about, fire away. So we only have about 15 minutes. I would like to uh, ask your take on the Republican National Convention. How did it go? Any big surprises that you saw coming out of it? Uh, no big surprises. Uh, pretty, um, well, in the times of uh, the coronavirus, right, there's not a whole lot of uh, things that are the same, right? I mean, the, the, obviously the biggest difference was the, uh, for both conventions, really the, the move away from the big arena filled with thousands and thousands of people who greet the speakers. Uh, and, and that, I think, um, in some ways may have detracted a little bit from the conventions, uh, but at the same time, you know, it'll be interesting to see in four years if the parties take anything from 2020 and apply it in 2024. They might find that they they liked some of the fact uh, that they could really control much more tightly the, the speakers, uh, the timing of it, et cetera. Of course, uh, with uh, the final night of the Republican convention, uh, President Trump did move uh, closer to the, the traditional uh, method of delivering an acceptance speech with uh, all of those folks on the on the South Lawn of the White House. Um, but again, no big surprises except for uh, the, the shifts that we've, we have to see during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and the, the race looks like it's maybe tightening a little bit coming out of the conventions but no huge bump for either candidate. Yeah, I will say I've enjoyed the storytelling that mm. has come out of both of the conventions, them getting with real people telling real stories. I think that's been a plus that may continue. What was your take on the president using the White House as a backdrop? I think that it's maybe a little surprising. Um, however, again, it's, it's, a, it's an instance where both parties, I think, would have liked to have been in those respective cities that that had been planning for this uh, for these events for for years, really. Um, but it's not like we haven't seen presidents campaign from the White House. Maybe not with a uh, an acceptance speech like that, but uh, presidents use the White House all the time. Whenever and whenever they're running for re-election, they are uh, at the White House in their official capacities, and sometimes they get asked. Uh, campaign questions from the from the press, uh, and and I think that it's it maybe a, may have been a little more than we're used to, but um, you know for me not a big deal. One, one surprise that came from the convention for me, David Dulio, professor of political science at Oakland University, was that there wasn't a, any update to the party's platform that was announced at the convention. That's very unconventional for. Uh, what we see during uh, during these conventions every four years. Any r rationale that you believe was behind that decision, that decision, or or why they decided not to announce any changes at the convention? Well, I think in in both instances, uh, Democratic convention and Republican convention, the, the, there's a big difference between what happens during the daytime at these conventions and what happens when the public tunes in in prime time for the speeches. And uh, certainly during the Democratic convention, the, the policy issues that were discussed, uh, frankly, tended to be a little bit more extreme than what the party wanted to show on TV in, in prime time. And so I don't think that there's a huge surprise in, in either party trying to say, uh, well, we developed our platform, but we're not really gonna talk about it. And just to clarify, Legally, individuals can only vote once. What do you think the president was trying to do when he was uh, suggesting people should vote twice? Uh, frankly, I think he was trying to troll us. I think he was trying to troll the media. Uh, and, and look at the reaction that he got, right? I mean, it, 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 
he got a, a bunch of people, including a bunch of Democrats, to come out and say, yes, it is illegal to vote twice. You cannot vote uh, via absentee and try to go to your polling place, uh, which is kind of what he's been, the, the point that he's been trying to make for months, right, is, is he's been warning us about this, warning us that, you know, that, that people are going to try to do this. And of course, right, in a, in a totally Trump manner, uh, comes out and says pretty much the opposite, Encour as you say, encouraging people to, or seemingly encouraging people to, to vote twice, but he got the reaction from Democrats that he wanted. So I do wonder, uh, we forget, he, he, was, he is a business person, first and foremost, and mm -hmm. he was also a reality star and the creator of reality television. You know, to some regard, he was very successful in that platform. So I look at some of the moves that he makes and his use of Twitter, and mm -hmm. is he extremely intelligent and there's a plan behind what he's doing, or is he just doing it on the whim? I don't know which one to believe. Well, and, and neither do I, right? I mean, I think that that's, it, it's, uh, we have the same reaction to, to this, a lot of this stuff, I think, Jackie. And uh, it's, it could be either one. Uh, and, and maybe he's in the White House, uh, just laughing up, a, laughing up a storm whenever uh, some of the, the unconventional moves that he makes uh, turn out to benefit him. I mean, maybe he's crazy like a fox. <laughs> That's, I, I do think, I'm like, he has to have a plan. There has to be a plan behind this. And I will say, <laughs> his, uh, his uh, attack on media with fake news, mm -hmm. I think has actually been very effective and successful in helping him manage his message to his con uh, con uh, his followers mm -hmm. and in securing in his message. Do you agree? Uh, to, uh, 100%. I, and, and, but let's be careful, right? It, it, the advent of Donald Trump's candidacy and then administration is not the start of Republican distrust of the media. It goes back decades and, and you know, back to uh, certainly uh, the early 90s and, and Speaker Newt Gingrich in the House of Representatives. Um, but before that, uh, George H.W. Bush, Ronald Reagan even, where Republicans for, for as I said, decades, uh, have felt like they don't get a fair shake with the press. Uh, and uh, Trump has taken it to another level. And I think you're exactly right that his base loves it when he attacks the press. Uh, it, it energizes his base. It, it helps them coalesce even more than they, than they already are. Uh, it, so it, it's a strategy that works for him, no doubt. Yeah, do you think he would get away with being able to do that had we not had social media and other platforms for his followers to actually utilize and connect with one another. If we, this was the good old days where you had the three TV stations and just your local daily paper, I don't think it would work so well for him. I, I think you're right. The, the internet and, and social media platforms in particular make it much easier uh, to communicate directly with, uh, with, with your, with your base, with your, with your constituents, with your followers. And it is, it, it's, it's a way to, to move, uh, to, to go over the heads of the press, right. To, to, to have no filter, right. Where in the, back in the old days, in the days of print or radio, or, or as you mentioned, the, the three networks, uh, a candidate's, or a, a president's statements would be filtered through reporters and editors. Now they can go right to the people. So in, with Trump and his message and how he is reaching the public and the people, how does that impact our local elections? Well, I, to some extent, you see those practices sort of trickling down. Uh, and I think that uh, whether it's it's how candidates interact with their with their potential voters online uh, through basic websites, through advertisements, through social media uh, engagements. Uh, you see some of that filtering down. I also think too, you, we see just driving around our local area. Sometimes you'll see, uh, for instance, uh, a candidate for a, a more local office uh, explicitly call out and say, 
I'm not just a Republican, I'm a Trump Republican. Uh, and, and so I think that that you, it does have an effect. As a student studying political science, I know that uh, you guys are just jumping into the new semester there at Oakland University. Do you think this is going to excite students? And, and it brings, because it is a crazy time in politics, although politics have always been crazy. I think we're just paying more attention to it now because it seems so divisive. As mm -hmm. a student going into political science, do you think it's going to attract more students or turn students away from the arena of political science? That's really interesting. I, I think you could make a case for it either way, but the numbers that we're seeing in our department are, are that it is drawing more students. And, and, I, and I'll give you just two comparison data points. You know, the, the, the number of uh, students in our classes this fall semester are up. The number of new majors that we have uh, in political science at Oakland University are up. So I think that that people are not only interested, but they're they're they have a, a, a draw to study it and learn more about it. We have just a few minutes uh, left here with you. And before we go, I know we've uh, talked about this before, but the civic engagement project over there at Oakland University, I think, is such an important asset to our community for people to understand what what you guys are doing over there. Can you uh, go ahead and just briefly update us on the program and also some of your upcoming events and how people can sign up if they want to? Sure. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, we're going to, you know, as I as I talked to you all before, one of the things that we want to do at the center is is have Oakland University become known as a convener of conversations around issues of public importance. And with COVID nineteen, we can't we can't very well convene. Right? We can't get together physically, but we can virtually. Uh, so all of our stuff will be virtual uh, in the fall semester. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about um, uh, two or three things that, that are going on. Uh, one is our uh, office hours series where we're gonna highlight faculty from across the campus really about issues related to, to civics and, and current events, et cetera. The first one, uh, we had on uh, Wednesday of this week, uh, the day before classes started, uh, we featured uh, three faculty from our Department of Sociology, Anthropology, Social Work, and Criminal Justice. And they talked about how protests can, can turn into social change. Uh, of course, in the wake of the uh, George Floyd killing and the protests that we've seen across the country in recent weeks and months. Uh, and we had, we had 75 folks turn out for a pretty much a, a call like this where uh, they listen to our our uh, expert faculty, ask them questions. Uh, so we try to make it as interactive as possible uh, as, as much as we can with the platforms that we're, that we're forced to use right now. We're gonna do three more of those in the rest of the fall semester, one more in September, one in October, one in November, all focused on campaign 2020. One of them will be focused on the economy with a couple of economists from our School of Business Administration. One in October will be uh, an election preview with me and a couple other political scientists. And then we'll do a wrap up, uh, a campaign debrief, if you will, in, after the, one week after the election. We're also going to do uh, something with uh, uh, the Civility Project that's started by Nolan, Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson. Nolan Finley, of course, from the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson from WDET uh, uh, Public Radio in Detroit, where the Civility Project is really uh, all about their relationship as, as two folks who disagree uh, strongly politically, uh, but they maintain a wonderful friendship. And I, I've been part, I've, I've been part of uh, other editions of the, the program they're going to put on for us uh, in October, October 6th. Um, and they, they talk about how their relationship is better because they disagree politically, but they, they disagree in the, in the quote unquote right way and they do it respectfully. Right. So they, they're really, what I, th one of the great things about it is that they model the behavior that I would like to see. And I think we all would like to see more of our, more of our friends and neighbors use as they, uh, talk about politics. We could all use some of that right now. About 20 seconds left. One last question. John James, Gary Peters. 
that is heating up. We are seeing a ton of commercials. Who wins? No. Oh, gosh, way too early to tell. Two months in politics is like two lifetimes. <laughs> There you go. David Julio with us on the Oakland County Megacast, professor of political science and director of the Center for Civic Engagement. Head over to Oakland University's website. Learn more about the Center for Civic Engagement. Great things that they are doing over there to bring all of us together and educate us here in Oakland County.